Okay, um, today I'll be talking about custom assay development for cell and cell-based therapies. Assay development is critical to development and commercialization of cell and cell-based therapies. Uh, testing of these uh, products to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency is required by regulatory authorities. Uh, Pre-existing assays can be utilized for some of this testing, but some degree of custom assay development is usually required, especially regarding potency testing, since these assays are usually specific to the therapy uh, that has been developed. In recent years, the cell and cell-based therapy industry has experienced increasing capacity uh, constraints in routine product testing and analytical assay development. Uh, these constraints have caused issues, specifically delays in product development, product supply, clinical trials, regulatory filings, and approvals. Uh, so we've come up with sort of several testing strategies that can be used to mitigate this risk. Uh, one being using a robust assay development process, uh, focus on potency assays since they're so critical, uh, the use of qualitative versus quantitative safety assays, and the use of automated um, infectious disease monitoring assays. Um, and last of all, use of phase-appropriate validation. So now I will go over, go over each of these strategies in more detail. So the first thing is really looking at a, the assay development process. Uh, there are several key steps in this process, and they're outlined on this slide. I know there's a lot of things to consider, and you can see for each step, um, there's a few items. These, however, are not all of the items. These are just some of the key items uh, that I thought were most important. But, you know, the bottom line is it's a very busy slide, but there's really kind of a, a couple of uh, key messages I want to convey. One, obviously, you can see based on this, there's a lot to consider uh, when developing and implementing assays. So it's a, it's a pretty involved process. Thus, Number two, this process can take quite a bit of time. So obviously the earlier you get started, the better. Um, so you can get through it. Um, third is whether designing assays from scratch or tech transferring assays you've developed, your laboratory really needs to be able to do three things. And that is they need to make your assays sustainable, scalable, and repeatable. Um, and so that obviously takes time, especially if you're tech transferring those assays. So um, you need to take that into consideration. And last of all, you really need an experienced lab partner uh, that can help with this. Experience is important. As you can tell, because it is a complicated process, if you have a lab that has done this before, it makes the process go a lot easier um, and usually uh, possibly a little quicker. So already mentioned a little bit about potency assays, but really what is the criticality of potency assays? So really the, the best place to start is what is a potency assay or what is potency? So the, the fancy FDA definition of potency is the specific ability or capacity of the product as indicated by appropriate laboratory tests or by adequately controlled clinical data obtained through the administration of the product in the manner intended to affect a given result. So very legalese, the bottom line, or simply put, potency is the ability of your product, in this case, your therapy, to do what it is supposed to do. What is the biological activity? It, and it's really showing that it's able to do that biological activity that's specific to your product. Based on this definition, uh, potency is unique, and that is it's really the only critical quality attribute or CQA uh, that's linked directly to efficacy of the product. So that is why the FDA and other regulatory agencies harp on this is because it's really the key attribute that shows truly the efficacy of your product. So I cannot stress this enough. You must have assays to prove the potency of your product. And this proof is needed for regulatory approval. So without validated potency assays, a therapeutic product cannot be licensed 
as demonstrated by the FDA's recent position regarding the cell therapy that looked great. It showed great clinical benefit, but lacked sufficient proof of potency, thus wasn't given regulatory approval. So now let's go over sort of a specific example of potency. Um, this example involves mesenchymal stromal cells or MSCs. So these are cells of interest as potential uh, cell therapies because of their immunomodulary capabilities. They can, most of the cases, downregulate or in some cases upregulate certain uh, immune cells. So peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs are immune cells that really mount the immune response to anything foreign. So the immunomodulatory properties of these mesenchymal stromal cells should prevent the expansion of PBMCs even in the presence of a stimulant. So even when these PBMCs should be expanding and proliferating, if it's immunomodulatory, those MSCs can actually cause those cells to not proliferate. And so you can take this concept or this function and utilize it as an in vitro potency assay. And that's what's shown here. So you can see on the y-axis, it shows the cell count, so the general number of cells. And then on the x-axis, you can see the different conditions. So you start on the far left with the dark blue. Those are your PBMCs. And then if you add MSCs, obviously you get very little change. But then if you can see in the green, if you take those PBMCs and you stimulate them, so in other words, give them, they think something foreign is around, they will then proliferate and you'll get a very large increase in your cell count. Then if you come back and add basically your mesenchymal stromal cells to the green, which is what you see in the gray, you can see then that they immunomodulate, or in this case, they're downregulating the immune response and decreasing the proliferation of those cells. So this is a quantitative value that you could um, determine and utilize to determine the potency of your product. So why is it important? Why you know, do potency and why is FDA and other regulatory agencies harping on it so much is really kind of shown here. So here's a, this is basically showing the positive and negative CD markers determined by flow cytometry. Uh, on mesenchymal stromal cells or MSCs. And these cells were all started from the same stock, but were expanded using different culture supplements. So that's what you see up the top of both of those tables. Um, you can see that we utilized, you know, fetal bovine serum, AB serum, and really different kind of lysate products. And so Based on, and these are also, let me state, these are the recommended characterization markers by um, ISCT. So you can see here, if you look at the top table, those are positive markers, so they should be present and they're present in all of the cells. And then if you look at the negative markers, they're um, not present, uh, which is what you would expect. So the bottom line is, they all, the, all these cells, regardless of what media supplement you added, really look the same on the outer surface based on these CD markers. But what if you actually look at potency of these cells? Is it the same or not? And so we took the same cells, performed a potency assay on them, uh, looking for their ability in this case to induce T regulatory or T reg cells from those PBMCs. So instead of just looking for expansion of them, we're looking at expansion or presence of a specific um, immune cell, in this case, the Treg cell. And this is using MSCs from three different donors and performed multiple times. And so what you wanna look at here is kind of the same as the other graph. If you look to the left, you can see the, the or excuse me, on the y-axis, you can see the Treg or an amount of PBM, Treg cells as a percentage of PBMCs. And then on the x-axis, you have the different media supplements like we showed before. And you can see here, really what you want to focus are the green and the dark blue. So the green is basically the PBMCs with the stimulant. And then the blue is if you then add the MSCs. And you can see that they're quite different. Some of them downregulate a little bit. And some of them, if you look to the far right, the HPR, A, and B, 
you actually get um, a much larger increase in those Treg cells. So the really kind of the take home message is, even though the cells look the same from what the industry uses to characterize them, their function is different. So that is why regulatory agencies are harping on potency. And that's why it's so critical because you wanna make sure that your product, when you're giving it to patients, has the appropriate level of potency. It may look the same on characterization tests. It may you know, not contain infectious diseases, so it passes safety, but you need to also make sure that it truly has potency and is really going to do what it is supposed to do. So that's, that's why it's so important. One of the other strategies I want to talk about is this whole concept of qualitative versus quantitative. Um, critical quality attributes or CQAs are defined here on the slide, but really they're just kind of the, a physical chemical or a property or characteristic um, that really you utilize to make sure they're in appropriate limit or range to ensure the quality of the product. Um, you use these CQAs to define the key, attribute, key attributes, which in this case are of these type of products is really safety, purity, and potency. Traditional safety assays uh, to detect infectious, infectious agents and products have been quantitative uh, assays. So you're actually getting an actual value. There's no current regulatory requirement though that these assays have to be quantitative. So what we looked at and what we're proposing today is that you can actually utilize qualitative assays. So qualitative assay is really an assay where you're looking for a yes, no response, and you're not necessarily getting a quantitative value. So why would you do this and what's kind of the advantage? Well, if you look here at this slide and you look at the left of the, the first graph on the left there, you can see that what we're looking at are two things. Uh, focus on the LOD, which is limit of detection there in the center, and then the LOQ, which is the limit of quantitation. And what you can tell from this, if you look at relative frequency on the y-axis, that your LOD, your limit of detection, your qualitative value is always gonna be more sensitive or lower than your limit of quantitation or LOQ. But the big question is, how big is that difference? Well, it kind of varies. Um, and so if you look to the right there, you can see in the table where we took um, a bunch of assays for different viruses. We tested them on mesenchymal stromal or MSC samples. And you can tell if you look at the LOD versus the LOQ, the LOD is always lower, but in some cases the difference isn't large. But if you look in examples like Epstein-Barr virus there, the EBV, you can see that it's a significant difference. It's a 24 times more sensitive looking at LOD versus LOQ. So that's why we recommend using qualitative assays whenever you can for safety, because you can actually get a much more sensitive assay than you can with a quantitative assay. And sort of taking that idea of using qualitative safety assays a step further, we have shown that you can use automated, high throughput, qualitative infectious disease monitoring assays that are traditionally used for blood screening to test these cell products. In other words, in this case, mesenchymal stromal cells. So the data showing the LODs for these assays is shown in the table on the right but we also ran all of the other tests to determine uh, specificity, precision, and robustness. And all that data can be seen on our paper, paper titled Testing Strategies and Custom Assay Development for Cell and Cell-Based Therapies on the Facilitate website. But why would you use these type of, you know, kind of monitoring safety assays versus uh, a true quantitative assay? Um, the, really kind of the main reasons are one is these high throughput qualitative monitoring assays that are uh, for infectious disease testing have been tweaked. So they're very sensitive because they're utilized traditionally for blood screening uh, or blood donor screening, excuse me. 
Um, this approach or using these assays came natural to us since our background is in donor screening and high throughput assays. So really the, the true advantage of using these assays are they generally produce faster results. They're less expensive to run since you're not having to run multiple replicates or quantitative standards and being fully automated. So you basically put the samples in and walk away. It saves you time and it's less risk of human error in the testing process. So you really get a kind of a higher quality um, result. Now, if the qualitative assay gives a positive result, our testing algorithm is set up that we can perform and give a quantitative value. So we do quantitative assays if we need to, but really the strategy is to use a qualitative assay as a pre-screen and then spend that extra time and money if you need it and run that um, quantitative assay as a confirmatory and then you can have the actual value if you need it. And then the last thing I wanna go over the last strategy is really kind of the phase appropriate or concept of phase appropriate validations. So as you can see here, if you look to the left for process development and preclinical work, assays and analytical procedures may not need to be validated. Since many of the properties being measured may not be CQAs or critical quality attributes, you really do not have to go through a formal or full validation for these. So many times the methods, platforms, markers used um, to characterize a therapeutic will evolve during the development and preclinical work. Therefore, analytical analysis must be flexible and adaptable and assays do not need to be fully validated in the early stages of the process. So bottom line is you're really trying to figure out what your CQAs are. So because of it, and you're not really you know, set on them, then you can basically perform just um, moderate uh, tests on them and you do not have to do a full validation and thus spend the time and money to do that. However, if you look at clinical, then once you are in the clinical phases, you should have your CQAs locked down, so to say, and these assays do need to be fully validated. So you do need to do your specificity, linearity, range, all of the different attributes that are listed here on the slide. So it makes sense, right? Early on, when you're still kind of figuring out what your true assays are, there's no need to do it. But once you truly know they are and you're in clinical um, studies, then you need to go ahead and make sure that those assays have been fully validated. That way, you're not spending extra time and money early on when you really don't have to. So kind of to summarize, what are the kind of key takeaways? It is critical um, I can, to choose the right testing laboratory for your therapeutic development program. Um, some custom assay development will be required, especially in the regards of potency testing, because these assays are not off the shelf and these assays are specific to the actual therapeutic. Using a robust development process and defining specifications as early as possible will save you time and potentially get your product to market sooner, okay? So the sooner the better. Using qualitative safety assays when you can, they can be uh, much more significantly more sensitive than quantitative assays. There's currently no regulatory requirement for the use of quantitative safety assays. So once again, use qualitative assays when you can. Consider using high throughput qualitative infectious disease monitoring assays when you can and always perform phase appropriate validations for your analytical assays. Don't spend that extra time and money on that validation when you don't need to. In other words, do not over-validate. And then last slide here, I just sort of wanted to thank all the members of the BioBridge Global team and Qualtex Laboratory teams um, that really did all the work and generated all the data that I showed you today. So with that, that ends the, my presentation for today.